Hi, folks. Pastor Mike Spalding here with my good friend and big brother. I am Pastor Casper, and we're here together to encourage you to keep listening to Deception Detection Radio, because we're both on this network with our individual shows. Yes, and yes. And we're going to be doing some things together as well, not to not say no more. Hey, folks, tune in Deception Detection Radio, some of the best programming in Christian talk, news, encouragement, and Bible studies. God bless you. God bless Hi everyone, I'm Kay Carswell, owner of Deception Detection Radio Network. It's with great excitement I welcome the newest addition to our network, Stone Cold Truth, with host Jeremy Stone. Tonight, he welcomes Phil Baker of Reclaiming the Faith from the Fourth Watch Radio Network. Now let's join Jeremy and Phil as they discuss the origins of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, how you doing, Phil? Welcome to the Stone Cold Truth Podcast, man. Man, I'm doing good. It's really, really an honor to be on the show with you today, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. It's a, you know, my first episode. I'm really excited to get right into the controversy with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right, man. Well, you want to start off in case all those you know who are listening for the first time don't know who you are. You want to just give you a little background about yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, grew up in a Christian home, going to church every week, doing the Sunday school thing. Royal ambassadors is like Christian uh, Boy Scouts, um, you know, children's choir, all that kind of stuff. Uh, walked the aisle when I was seven, uh, gave my life to Jesus, at least I thought I did. But really, it was just trying to fit in uh, with a bunch of my friends that were doing it about the same time. Uh, flash forward a couple of years, or a few years, um, I'm 14, and my my dad gets kicked out of the house. I'm in uh, my first year of high school, and I go pretty wild uh, with my brother that's a couple of years older than me, get into a lot of drinking and, and drugs and stuff, and um, almost die a couple of times. And uh, when I'm 16, I'm at a Young Life camp, and it's like I heard the gospel for the first time. I, I really understood that I needed a Savior. So that's when I really believed that that I became a Christian, giving my life to Jesus. I was still a real angry guy, um, had a lot of just internal conflicts that needed to get sorted out, and didn't have anybody discipling me. And so after a couple of disappointments, kind of went back, backslid, basically, and into much worse drug addiction. I jumped to about 19, thinking about killing myself, heavy, heavy drug addiction. And um, I felt God telling me to go to my, my church and seek out my uh, youth leader. I didn't really have a relationship with. I was up there, and he's like, man, I'm going to teach you how to, how to lead worship. And I didn't really understand what that meant. But he did. He took me under his wing and discipled me and Man, just got into ministry pretty quickly, um, leading leading worship for the students, and then started doing camps and retreats and leading worship for all different kinds of denominations, and that was pretty cool. Um, got into youth ministry in 2004, eventually became a pastor. Now I'm kind of doing like a jack-of-all-trades, master of none kind of stuff for a church, but um, yeah, man... Uh, it's it's a wild journey. God's got a lot of surprises for us. I never thought I'd be like writing curriculum for for elementary school kids. Like <laughs> it's really weird what I'm doing right now. But uh yeah. It's so, awesome though, man. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Getting to shape the hearts and minds of the young ones. So Yeah. It's, good. it's important. Yeah, it is, it is for sure. There's a lot of terrible curriculum out there. So uh yeah, man. I uh, wrote a book, 2016, called New Wineskins and the Simple Words of Christ. Um, it's kind of about how we all come to faith with uh, different presuppositions that ke- keep us from taking Jesus at His Word. Uh, I eventually got to be interviewed by a BDK of Omega Frequency. We kind of hit it off and started doing a Q&A show called Ready With An Answer on his channel and Justin Fall's channel. And um that was really cool. He encouraged me to start podcasting. So I started that about a year ago and uh, maybe a year and a half ago and <laughs> kind of figuring it out as I go. So yeah, man, yeah. Uh, if people want to check that out, you can go to philsbaker.com or reclaimingthefaith.podbean.com. 
Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much, man. Yeah, I've checked out, you know, I've been following you and uh, BDK and the fourth watch for a long time, man. It's it's such a blessing and it's very important for people to hear. And I think the, uh, you know, the question is and answer thing is like a, it's a must nowadays. So many people have so many questions and, you know, a lot of people don't have the time to sift through all that and really, you know, get down to the knit and grit. So I want to thank you guys for that. And yeah, I know that show has blessed me and it's probably blessed so many others, man. Oh, well, thanks, man. I'll pass that on to BDK. Yes, definitely. Thank you. All right, man. So you want to have, you want to get right into this? You, uh, where, where would you like to start off? Uh, dude, you, you call it, man. You I call, call it. it. All I'll right. just follow your lead. All right. So we're going to be talking about the origins of the Roman Catholic Church. And basically, if it has any biblical basis, um, you know, in, within this theology and its structure. Um, so I guess we'll start off by um, speaking first about when the Roman Catholic sh- Church was like officially, you know, what they are today, you know, back in like the 300 AD era. And then from there, we'll take it to the pre Nicene Church and see if their, th- their theology and their interpretation of Scripture, you know, coincides at all with what the roman catholics have done you know what i'm saying sure awesome yeah man uh so like when we think about catholicism today you know we think about the pope calling himself the bishop of all bishops you know the holy father vicar of christ pontifex maximus you know like the high priest that kind of stuff um having the authority to you know say whatever uh and i don't know not whatever he wants but um, he can, he can give commands to billions of people you know, around the world. Like right. if we think about that kind of a thing, it, it kind of developed over time. You can kind of see it, uh, with the Bishop of Rome, uh, wielding some power, at least talking trash, like he should be wielding some power. Um, back in around 250, you had the Bishop of Rome called Stephen. And, uh, this is... Basically, the first guy who, the first bishop of Rome who was like, man, I descend from Peter. I can trace my, my not his, uh, you know, blood lineage, but um, how he's, he goes back to the seat of Peter, which is in Rome. And so, therefore, everybody needs to listen to him. And so, you had this little controversy going on around 250 where Stephen, this bishop of Rome, was saying that people that were heretics or like uh, Gnostics, that if they got baptized, because Gnostics call themselves Christians, and so right. basically Stephen was saying, you know, if you're if you're a Gnostic and you convert to Christianity, you don't need to be baptized again. We'll just lay hands on you. But uh, the bishops all around Rome, for the most part, were like, that's crazy. They definitely needs to be baptized again because a non-believer becoming a believer should be baptized. Right. It doesn't matter if the non-believer called themselves a Christian in the past; they did not really believe in Jesus. So uh, you got these guys like uh, Cyprian and Fermilion, who were different bishops at that time. Cyprian was the bishop of Carthage in North Africa, like where Hannibal came from, and Fermilion was the bishop of uh, Caesarea. And uh, they're kind of they're kind of big shots very well respected by the other bishops and um, challenged this guy very respectfully. But they're like, look, man, you know, you are a a bishop, but you don't have the right to like order our churches to do what we want. You can do what you want. You can have your church do, you know, what you think is best, but you can't order our churches around. And that's kind of the way it was like the bishops at that time, uh, all through the, the, uh, you know, pre-Nicene, anti-Nicene time, uh, they kind of worked as a team while having um, like unity with diversity. Like they had, they right. were independent, but they worked as a team. They did. It, I mean, surprising. Like in this correspondence, C- uh, Cyprian's correspondence with Stephen, he's like, "Yeah, you know, you do. Um, you you are the bishop of Rome, just like Peter was the rock." 
Um, and Jesus said he would build his church on Peter. That's right, but that doesn't mean, you know, but that doesn't mean you're the bishop of bishops. That doesn't mean you're the pope. You know, like this word yeah. pope means father. And Jesus says, you know, you're only supposed to call one person father in terms of like a role of uh, like governing authority. And that's God. Like Jesus calls God Holy Father in John 17. So um, that's a that's a really interesting point in history because that's when the bishops of, of Rome, not that they weren't corrupt before that. They were pretty licentious before that. Many of them were, not all, but many of them were. Um, but that's when they really start to get a big head and uh, start to try to wield their power. You know, and it's interesting how a church like that gets corrupt because Rome and why they were looked to with all this, um, with this authority, you know, they were a pretty rich church, pretty wealthy church, really popular church because, you know, like what city was bigger than Rome. And so it's, it's easy to like, look at the people that are rich, look at the people that are popular, look at the people that, um, have clout in society to ascribe to them special pomp, special privilege, special authority that maybe God doesn't give them. It's kind of like in churches when they find the richest per- person in the congregation and they make them the chairman of the deacons or chairman of the elders, you know, because they've got the money. And it's it's really dangerous when a church is operating that way because, you know, they they can tend very easily to fall into moral corruption and decay. And that's kind of what you see going on with the church in Rome. And maybe it's even going back to Peter's time, because in Second Peter, you know, he says he's writing to, to the Christians from Babylon. And Peter at that time was in Rome. So it's interesting that he calls Rome Babylon. But, you know, and I'm sorry to be kind of trailing off or, or going off in a... No, you're little, good. Little rabbit trails, but like, it's it's interesting how the um, the popes say that Rome is the church because that's where Peter was the bishop. But you know, because Peter preached in Rome. If you look at the early Christian writings, they talk not just about Peter preaching there, but Paul as well. Right. Um, that that Paul was one of the main founders of that church in Rome, even though neither one of them actually founded the church, but it was probably believers from Pentecost that were there visiting that that first Pentecost um, when the Holy Spirit came down, uh, that they, believers that were visiting Jerusalem from Rome, actually started the Roman church. Nobody knows who actually planted that church. Nobody knows. But we know it wasn't Paul and it wasn't Peter. But it's it's cool because, you know, we could see, we could say, you know, well, if Peter preached in Rome. He also preached in Antioch. Paul talks about that in Galatians 2. That's when they had their like their throwdown about Peter acting in a hypocritical way. Peter preached in Antioch. Peter also preached in Samaria, and Peter definitely preached in Jerusalem. So which is the official church that Peter's the, the head of? It's kind of right. interesting. And even though Peter was like, in many respects, the head, um, and I'm sorry, man. I'm, I'm like jumping around again. No, I think you're right on track, man. Keep going. Yeah, you're dude. Good. Um, so, like Matthew 17 kind of gives us a clue as to why Peter was the spokesperson for for the disciples, and that's because he was the oldest. In Matthew 17, this guy comes to the door where Peter, the disciples, and Jesus are, and he he's coming to collect a temple tax. And if you were 20 years old or older, you had to pay the tax. Now, all the disciples are in the room. Yet, guess who the only two people are to pay the tax? It's it's Jesus and Peter. Right. It's interesting, which means, I mean, that's one of the passages where we look back to to see that the disciples were teenagers. They were all teenagers, except for Peter. He's the only one that's 20 or older. And so just naturally, um, especially in that type of society, the oldest speaks for the group. And so it's it's kind of natural that he would be like the spokesperson at Pentecost, uh, even though John is right there with him, you know, in the weeks following when they healed the guy at, at the gate called Beautiful. Um, Peter's kind of the spokesperson. But when you get to uh, like Acts 15 in the Jerusalem Council, uh, so this is 
a matter of whether uh, the Gentiles need to live like Jews and to what degree do they need to be circumcised, what Jewish laws do they need to adhere to. The dude running the show is actually James, the brother of Jesus. Paul's there, Peter's there, the apostles are there, and yet it's James, the brother of Jesus, that they're deferring to. And the main church at that time is Jerusalem. And Peter, even though he is, in one sense, he has prominence because of his age and his stature, he defers to James. And uh, that's something that we'll talk about later in terms of, like, um, you you see bishops of Rome letting others uh, in the pre-Nicene era era, um, do their thing. Like, they're not wielding a heavy hand in the pre-Nicene era era generally. But... um, the the in the post nicene era the first guy to really wield the potential power of the pope is a uh, leo pope leo around 440 to 461 so in the mid 5th century and he says he he asserts that the pope has the authority over all bishops because they've been given the keys the power of the keys and Jesus passed that to Peter, and supposedly Peter passed that on to his successors. And so that's where you, I guess you could maybe say it, it really began to be like, like the foundation of the, um, the Catholic Church like we know it. And this term, Pontifex Maximus, which mm-hmm. means the supreme bridge builder, that's, that's more, it's not even a, a Catholic term in its origin it's a Custom Roman Caesar, right? That's right. That's right. He is the supreme bridge builder between, you know, like the gods and man. He was the high wow. priest, you know. And so the Pope is actually taking on this supremely pagan title for mm-hmm. himself, which though Jesus is the ultimate supreme, you know, bridge builder between God and man. He is the high priest and you see the Pope's they have this tendency to take what only belongs to God and, and apply it to themselves. And so right. we're going to talk about that too. So um, this Pontifex Maximus title comes in around uh, 366, 384. Um, but uh, the vicar of Christ term, which means like you're acting in the place of Christ. Uh, so the Pope, I mean, have you heard that term vicar of Christ? Yeah, yeah. I've always understood it to be the... You know, there's, you know, they have their own view of what it means. And then, you know, what what I've always thought it meant was that, you know, in a harsher sense, it's like the replacement of Christ or the representative of him on earth. Like he's got the authority to represent Christ alone on earth. Yeah, yeah. He's the visible head of the church on earth, acting for and in place of Christ. That's actually like a definition from a Catholic dictionary. So blasphemous. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the Holy Spirit, sorry, the, um, I just jumped the gun. The early Christians used that term vicar of Christ, but they applied it to the Holy Spirit because <laughs> that's what Jesus said in, in John 14, you know, another would be coming in his place, right? Another just like him, the guide mm-hmm. us into all truth. He's talking about the spirit of truth, right? So, again, you know, they're taking something that only belongs belongs to God and applying it to themselves. And, you know, b- before I go on, I, I got to say, I have Catholic friends that are, like, genuine in their faith. And right. I, I want to make a distinction. I'm not trying to bash Catholics here. But, like, if you hear me talk about the Reformation, you'd think I'd be bashing Protestants, and I'm not. Like, it's our leaders that we need to really pay attention to what they're actually saying and not necessarily take them at face value, but take everything, every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Filter everything through the Word of God. And so it's really hard, though, to step back from ourselves and like admit humbly that we all have these filters that we see truth through that we filter it through and you know some truth we we find it acceptable and so we keep it in other truth we're like no that doesn't feel good or that's not what my parents said or that's not what my pastor said or that's not what my friends think and we discard it 
And so we all have that battle. And so we don't need to like look down on Catholics because they've been taught their whole lives these things and they've been taught right. to not challenge them. I mean, we got to be gentle when we're talking to them because we probably have those same areas too. I'm sure I do. And I don't even know it. And that's the insidious thing about it. Like, I don't know all of my filters. I know some of them, but I don't know all of them. And they kind of get revealed over time. But, and it's usually when I get really, really angry when someone's challenging something that I hold dear. Like if, right. if someone's challenging something that I hold dear and I remain calm and I can defend it calmly and not get defensive, I'm probably doing pretty well there. But <laughs> if I'm getting angry or defensive, there's probably something wrong. Yeah, right, right. You know, like pride works up on us when things like that happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's when it's revealed. But, you know, I just want to step in real quick and say too that like i know people are going to listen to this and may maybe think that we're christian ba- bash or not christian but catholic bashing but we're not like because when you if you've ever like really had a conversation with a catholic they'll bring up a lot of protestant things too and if you really know what you're talking about you can step back and say hey like i'm not saying the protestants were perfect either because we know that luther had a lot of controversial things about him we know that there's like 43,000 different denominations within Protest- Protestantism, and all of that is kind of like they all divide. Mm. So when people like ask me, like, what am I for a denomination? I- I'm really not. Like, I-, I don't have a denomination. I read the Word of God for what it says. I study and do my research. I, you know, I, I really try to divide as much as I can the truth and not associate myself with any sort of you know, um, denomination, because to me, denominations are really just somebody's interpretation of something in the scriptures. And that set them apart from something else, you know, Hmm. and some other denomination. So I try to like separate myself and and I kind of lean more towards like, you know, one or the other, of course, in certain views of certain denominations, but I don't classify myself as one. And I know there's a lot of things within Protestantism, Protestantism, that is, you know, not okay, just like in Catholicism. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not Catholic bashing either. I love, I love Catholics. And I know that there are so many people out there who are Catholics and truly, truly have a heart for God. You know what I mean? Sure. Like their heart is straight for the Lord. And to me, those people in my eyes and heart aren't really considered Catholic because if you're like a dogmatic catholic you would be like worshiping the pope and all these images and like all these other things but if you're like considering yourself a catholic because you were baptized as a baby you know i hear that a lot too oh i was baptized as a baby i'm catholic well you know that's what they were taught to believe you know so it doesn't really define them yeah man yeah and you know kind of bringing it back to that uh protestant reformation you've got this council of trent that was a response to the Reformation that, that Luther brought about. And this Council of Trent, you know, it happens around you know, the mid-16th century, and it's a pivotal moment in, uh, in world history, really. Um, but just to highlight a couple of things that happened at the Council of Trent, they were rejecting the doctrine of sola scriptura, so like— um, that truth comes through only, you know, divine truth only comes through Scripture. Yeah, the Holy Scripture. And they said, you know, yeah, it comes through the Holy Scripture, but it also comes through the traditions of the Church, including the unwritten traditions, which is interesting because that's like, that's exactly what happened in Judaism with the Talmud and Mishnah and the oral tradition of the Pharisees, right? That's Phariseeism right there, where they would create traditions to supersede Scripture. They would create traditions in order to not have to actually obey God. And that's kind of what began right there in Catholicism. And uh, they also, they called for a reform of the indulgences that Luther was uh, very right in in railing against the Catholic Church and the Council of Trent called for a reform of them, but they also said that those who say that indulgences are useless or that the Church does not have the power to grant them are damned. So that's right. not good. You know? Right. 
Not of good course. at all. <laughs> yeah, they also affirmed the doctrine of purgatory in the Council of Trent and said that anyone who rejected it was also damned. So, yeah. Um, you see that a lot, too, and, and a lot of doctrines in today's age that if you if you don't agree with, you know, I know this is going to get thrown out there, but if, like, you disagree with Flat Earth or, you, you know, you stand on one side or the other, like, oh, you're not saved, or you believe in one saved, always saved, or you don't, you know, one of the other throws at you, you know, oh, well, then you're not saved. You don't really believe in the doctrine. You know what I mean? Sure. It's it's just the same way. It's, people have been throwing that around for centuries. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so you, then you got papal infallibility, which basically means that the Pope is incapable of erring even in the slightest way when teaching on matters of faith and morality. So it's not just the Pope can't sin. It's that he cannot make a mistake when he's in a, in an official capacity teaching on faith and morality. And that happened at the uh, First Vatican Council around 1870. And uh, it's interesting when you hear that kind of stuff, this papal infallibility. And I had a conversation with, with a Catholic friend of mine. I was bringing that up. And I asked her about what uh, Pope Francis said in 2014. And he gave this list to the world of the 10 secrets to living a happy life. And number nine on this is clearly teaching on matters of morality and faith. He says, number nine, it's crazy. This is like a secret to a happy life. He says, don't proselytize. So basically, don't try to change people's belief to your belief. Don't do that. Don't proselytize. Respect others' beliefs. We can inspire others through witness so that one grows together in communicating. But the worst thing of all is religious proselytism, which paralyzes, quote, I am talking with you in order to persuade you. <laughs> so wow. what's so ironic in that, and this is what I brought to her, I, I asked her, so like, is Pope Francis proselytizing there? You know? Right. Like, whose mind is he trying to change there? Well, clearly he's <laughs> trying to change everyone's mind by saying, don't try to change everyone's mind. It's so wicked. It's so evil. Like what he's doing there, that's straight up evil because right. he knows exactly what he's doing. Yeah, it's manipulative right there. Yeah, for sure. It's terrible. For sure, man. <laughs> so, yeah, man, that's that's kind of where I'd wrap up for, for that uh, question, unless you had something else that you wanted to kind of follow up with on that. Um, well, I, I think that I when I was talking to you before over email, I think – there was one thing I want to ask you. Is, is there anything in the pre-Nicene church writings from the fathers um, that maybe looks at Rome in like a, a more higher respect than any other churches? Or I know we may have covered that a little bit, but... Uh, they have respect for Rome because Rome has this, this place of prominence in terms of right. its popularity, uh, just as a massive city, a wealthy city. But... Um, it's interesting, they, they viewed the churches in Asia Minor in the first century and the middle, up until the middle second century, basically. So, like, anywhere from 33 to, like, 150. Um, they viewed those churches with uh, equal, if not sometimes more prestige and honor, because that's where a lot of the other apostles went. A lot of them went to this Asia Minor area, especially John. And it's interesting when you think about like the bishops of Rome. If 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 they were, you know, even if they were popes, let's just let's just you know make right. a hypothetical here with like Linus after Peter, and there's like one other guy, and Linus is mentioned, I believe, in like First or Second Timothy, and then Clement. Uh, which was mentioned, he was mentioned in uh, Philippians 4, um, and he wrote, or he's responsible for Clement of the letter Clement of Rome um, to the Corinthians. But John was alive during that time. John was alive most likely until about 90 or later with the reign of Domitian, according to like Eusebius. And uh, so if that's the case, are you going to take Linus? Is Linus <laughs> this disciple? And he's, I mean, he's a good disciple. Clearly, Paul thinks he's a great guy. Or even Clement. 
are they going to hold more sway than John? You know, the best friend of Jesus? Right. <laughs> it's, it's asinine to make that kind of an assumption. And um, so, you know, Rome was viewed with with respect, but you have these people that were disciples of the Apostle John that wrote extensively. People like Ignatius writing uh, at the end of the first century and beginning of second century, like that guy was a personal disciple of John. Ignatius was the Bishop of Antioch, and um, I mean, he tells people to obey their bishops, but he also says that he does not have the right to give commands like the apostles did, that he's just a mere man. So it's interesting, right. like he's saying, like, we should respect our authority, you know, but nobody has the right to give commandments anymore, because the apostles were all dead. So that's interesting. And then you got a guy like Polycarp. <clears throat> Sorry, Polycarp was a personal disciple of John also. And around 150 or so, he has this... uh he has this interaction with the Bishop of Rome named Anicetus, or Anicetus. And um, so there's this controversy over Passover, when you're supposed to celebrate Passover. Maybe it doesn't seem like a big deal to some people, but it was a, it, it was a big deal back then. I mean, it's one thing we're definitely supposed to celebrate and remember, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so Polycarp has a problem with Rome because Rome is not following the tradition of the apostles. The Romans, oh, so Passover is on the fourth, 14th day of Nisan. And so that would be, that could fall, like July 4th could fall on any day of the week. The 14th day of Nisan could fall on any day of the week too, because it's a, it's a lunar calendar, a Jewish lunar calendar. So, um, so the, Eastern churches, like the churches of Asia Minor and, and so on, like Polycarp's in Smyrna, I don't think I said that yet, but um, so they're celebrating Passover, the death of, of Jesus on the 14th day of Nisan, no ma- even if it's on a Monday, they celebrate it there, and then they celebrate the resurrection two days later on the 16th of Nisan, just like Jesus would die on Friday, he rises on Sunday, that's kind of how they approached it. Mm-hmm. The Roman Church celebrated the resurrection, the death and the resurrection of Jesus on the Sunday following the 14th. So whatever whatever day it was, the Sunday after the 14th, that's when they celebrated. And the problem with that was like in the Eastern tradition you got a lot of people fasting on Good Friday and on that Saturday just like Jesus is in the in the tomb. So they're fasting on those days. And so in Rome, you've got this mixture of people. You've got people from the East that kind of come there, and you got some Christians feasting and some fasting on these days, and nobody really, I don't know, it just kind of creates a little bit of probably envy or jealousy or, you know, hurt feelings there. And so they're trying to resolve this thing. So Polycarp takes a trip to Rome, and he meets up with Anicetus, or Anicetus, and basically they try to they try to convert each other to their own opinions. You know, like Polycarp's trying to win Anicetus to the, the earlier tradition. And Anicetus, he tries to win Polycarp. They eventually agree to disagree, basically, and very cordially. Right. They're like, you know, you can do your thing and we're going to do our thing. Polycarp, though, I mean, he is appealed. He's saying, this is how I was taught personally by John and the other disciples or the other apostles, like, who I interacted with. So he's like, I saw this firsthand, dude. <laughs> right. And, and he would have thought that would have won him over. Right. But he And here's Anicetus' argument, which is really interesting. He appeals, he's like, well, I have to do what the presbyters, like the elders, taught. So he doesn't appeal. It's really interesting. He doesn't appeal to the primacy of the Bishop of Rome. Like, this is what was handed down to me from the other bishops of Rome. That's not what he says. He says he has to do what, like, the elders of the church had been doing before he got there. So he doesn't appeal, as the Bishop of Rome, he doesn't appeal to his own, um, like, his own lineage, you know, going back to Peter. And he doesn't try to just tell Polycarp what to do, 
because he has the authority. And Polycarp doesn't come bowing and kissing the ring kind of stuff either. Polycarp's like, dude, we're equals. We're equal, you know, we're both bishops, but you should listen to the tradition of the apostles. So a really interesting scene there. Um, wow. Yeah, man. Uh, I, I don't know. Does that does that help answer the question? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely, man. That's that's pretty awesome. Like, trust me on this podcast, you can go down any rabbit trail, and I'm not saying you did, but any <laughs> rabbit trail you want to. <laughs> that was okay, awesome. Dude. <laughs> Um, but I was thinking maybe we could, uh, I don't know how much time we have. I don't even know how long we've been recording for, but, um, if we have time, do you want to get into maybe, um, the, the, uh, the crusades a little bit and, and how like true Bible believing Christians were actually affected by that? Wow. Um, probably weren't prepared for that one. Well, no, I mean, I'm not, I'm not like a crusades guy in terms of like really studied the history of it, but I mean, I know some general stuff, you know, they're going after the Muslims to build, to build the cathedral right in Rome. And so they're pillaging people and that would never be done. So I can tell you like from an early Christian perspective, how an early Christian would respond to the crusades. I can definitely tell you that you want me to go that direction? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, so Think like here's, here's Justin Martyr in 160. All right, he's writing an apology to the Roman emperor, and he says this, we, and he's speaking for Christians all around the world. He says, we who were filled with war and mutual slaughter and every wickedness have each throughout the whole earth changed our warlike weapons. We've changed our swords into plowshares, our spears into pruning hooks, and we cultivate piety, righteousness, philanthropy, faith, and hope, which we have from the Father himself through him who was crucified. Now it's evident that no one can terrify or subdue us who have believed in Jesus all over the world, for it's plain that though we're beheaded and crucified and thrown to wild beasts and chains and fire And all such kinds of torture, we do not give up our confession. But the more such things happen, the more do others and in larger numbers become faithful and uh, become faithful and worshipers of God through the name of Jesus. For just as if one should cut away the fruit bearing parts of a vine and it grows up again and yields other branches flourishing and fruitful, even so, the same thing happens with us. So... That's like crazy, right? Because wow. he's like every Christian throughout the whole world, we don't go to war. We don't fight. We don't. We don't. In fact, the way that we grow, our primary means of evangelism is turning the other cheek. Our primary means of evangelism is being killed instead of killing. Right. Like, because that's when it's... <laughs> It's almost like a quote, and I I hate to use Star Wars as a reference, but like the whole like Obi-Wan Kenobi kind of thing where he's like, you know, strike me down and I'm going to become so much stronger. Like that's kind of a picture. (laughs) It's kind of a picture of what what the early Christians believed. Like if you kill us, you're just causing like 10 more of us to to become born again because people are going to see that this is for real. That there is a hope that's worth dying for, you know, because we have a hope greater than the grave. Our Savior died and rose again, and so we have new life through Him. So it's just really powerful, and that's just one. I could give you a lot more, but the early Christians would definitely, therefore, never never take up arms against anyone, especially not for gold uh, or riches or to build temples, because they lived very simply. The Christians were, were poor people generally, and they didn't give a crap about buildings, they really didn't like the biggest house church kind of meeting thing that they had could maybe hold about 75 people. It, it, they didn't have cathedrals until the time of Constantine uh, with the Edict of Milan when he made Christianity legal, not the religion of Rome. That didn't happen until about 380. 
uh, right. with Emperor Theodosius, but he made Christianity legal and he put the church on the payroll. Basically, he he had you know selected bishops now on the payroll, and he began to turn the pagan temples into Christian cathedrals. That's when things changed so much in terms of like like what a modern worship service looks like. And you started to have more of like the Greek orator style from the uh, the people presiding over the service instead of more of a communal style, um, like, a, like almost like a Bible study kind of approach. Now you have these people giving fancy speeches and everyone's sitting in amazement, you know, and, and the robes and all that stuff where the clergy gets kind of separated from the rest of the people. So um, I'm sorry for rabbit trailing there too, man. I just got no, on a soapbox, set, but but yeah, like they they would have they would kick people out of the church that took part in things like the Crusades or like the Knights right. Templar that are getting baptized with their swords out of the water. Like you can have me, but you can't have my sword. Like that's complete BS. You know? Yeah, it's, nonsense right there. Yeah, it'd be like us bat- being baptized but keeping our wallet out. You know, or something like. <laughs> Like, are you serious? Like, God, you can have me, but you can't have my money, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, and looking back on it, too, when you can, like, you compare and contrast, like, how many more people would come to Christ knowing that people are, like, dying for their faith, you know, because they believe in something so heartedly than people coming and trying to, like, force it on you, you know? Like, when the Romans came, they slaughtered not only, like, Muslims, but you know, anybody who really disagreed with them and including people who owned a Bible, you know, if you, because at that time, you know, it was taught like, you know, Rome, you had to be taught scripture by your priest or by the head of your church. You, right. you weren't really supposed to own a Bible, you know, and they looked at that and they were killing, you know, you can go into the Anabaptists and all those, you know, s- sub baptist genres that got slaughtered for their faith in christ and they weren't doing anything wrong you would think they would be on the same page i mean maybe not in theology but they all believed in the same god yeah you know and it never worked out that way and i think it brings way more people in like in the roman times where people were you know fed fed lions yeah so many more people came to christ at that time than any time during the crusades right yeah, yeah, I, I definitely don't believe the Crusades were about spreading Christianity. No. Not at all. I mean, it's just a power play and greed and opulence, so. Yeah, it's sad. Yeah. It really is. But, I don't know, man, I think that wraps it up for today. Okay, cool. I have no more questions unless you want to, if you want to bring up anything or talk about anything, go for it, man. I'm I'm here all night. No, I mean, the only thing that was just coming to my mind when you were talking about yeah. them wanting to basically suppress the truth, like keeping people from knowing the scriptures, like that's kind of a theme in in Catholicism. Um, that's a theme with a lot of the uh, Catholic people that I know, like they've almost been conditioned to not read the scriptures, just to mm-hmm. take the the priest's word for it. But you know what? That's also a trend in a lot of churches today. Like, uh, right. I had, I heard like a 45 minute talk on discipleship the other day and not once did the person speaking say that we're supposed to teach people to obey the commands of Christ, which is like, that's right out of the great commission, the great in Matthew 28, you know, go into all the world, making disciples of all men teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, you know, baptizing in the name of the Holy uh, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They, they cited the Great Commission in generalities, but discipleship had nothing to do with learning the commands of Christ. And, you know, the Holy Spirit, or John, Jesus said in John 14 that the Holy Spirit would remind us of everything that he had taught. But how can we be reminded of something we've never heard? How can we be reminded of something we've never read? You know, so I just want to encourage people, whether you're Catholic or not, are you just listening to people like me talk about Jesus, or are you getting into your Bible yourself and reading it for yourself and reading it simply? You know, truth, truth is dangerous in one sense. It's dangerous to people who have something to protect that's of this world, but it's freeing for those who are of the kingdom of God. 
It's freeing for those who are of Christ. It's freeing for those who really care about the things of God and want to see his kingdom reach the ends of the earth. It's freeing. Amen. It liberates. And so I really want to encourage everyone that's listening, pick up your Bible, start with Matthew, read it. And believe that Jesus Christ really is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And no one supersedes him. He is above all things. He holds all things together. And he is the image of the invisible God. So if you want to know what you're supposed to be doing in life, if you want to know what God's will is for you, study Jesus. Mm hmm. Bring it, and that brings it back to your your book, man, because your your book breaks it down so simply, like new wineskins and the simple words of Christ. Like that's exactly what it is. It's the simple words of Christ, and I love how you do it, man. You really are able to teach what God is saying, and for people to be able to look at that and then apply it to their lives makes it much easier than you know go diving into like a giant theology book or a seminar. You know what I mean? Well, thanks, man. Yeah, it's it's really incredible, and I appreciate that. And I'm sure many of the listeners do, too. And, um, man, it's been a great night, and I'm so blessed to have you on my show, man. It's awesome. Yeah, I appreciate it, dude. It's uh, been a pleasure. Yeah, and uh, I also want to say, too, um, just for a disclaimer, I know I, you guys probably heard maybe some noises, you know, notifications popping up on my computer or my cat in the background. I'm going to work on that for my next episode. Um, I'm really sorry about that. My mic picks up a lot of stuff, and I don't know what to do about my cat. So oh, my, my dog's <laughs> been problems, over bro. here snoring. So <laughs> I'm sorry, man. <laughs> no, I haven't heard him once, dude. That's good. You're good. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. But dude, I hope I have you on again, man. I, I love you, bro, and it's good to connect with you. And I've been listening to you for so long, so it is like I get, like I said, it's a blessing, man, to be able to have you on my show. Yeah, that'd be awesome, dude. I appreciate it. Sweet, man. You have a good night, man, and uh, I'll stay in touch with you for sure, okay? All right. That sounds good. All right. God bless, bro. All right. You too.